Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. And I am super excited to introduce our special guest this week, Bradley Dupay. He is a global black belt with Microsoft, and we're going to have a discussion on VDI, Windows 365, ABD, all the good stuff. Bradley, if you can just give a quick introduction for our listeners on you know, what yeah. you've done with your career and what your current position is all about. Yeah. Hey, I really appreciate the invite to uh, come on the show today. I've been at Microsoft for, I'm going to say maybe 12, 13 years. Um, started out, you know, my background actually is is in Microsoft Exchange and Exchange Server. I've been working with, you know, that product probably back into the late 90s. Um, my favorite saying was always, you know, the Exchange guys used to be the smartest guys in IT because they had to know everything about servers, storage, security, antivirus, desktop clients, mobile load balancing, web servers, you know, think of all the protocols. So Exchange guys used to know everything. And then, you know, of course, we moved all that to Exchange Online uh, not that long ago, you know, maybe maybe uh, five, six, seven years ago. So uh, I had to go find a new expertise, a uh, new specialty. So I jumped into um, uh, endpoint and endpoint management uh, here at Microsoft. Been working uh, as, as a black belt. What I like to term is kind of the special projects team uh, in modern work at Microsoft where I get to work with engineering, I get to work with business planning, get to work directly with customers, I uh, get to work across a variety of different roles and really with a ton of different customers to see a, a bunch of different things. So, um, you know, I, I've been blessed with a, a good uh, technical solid background uh, and then, you know, have the opportunity to take that uh, uh, into all kinds of nooks and crannies here at Microsoft. We are super happy to have you here. Some of our listeners may not know what a global black belt is and just how special and unique that position is at Microsoft. How many people are in like your position for your specific product, like peers of yours? Yeah, so so um, the the specific kind of incubation team that we work on, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna estimate there's probably about 20 people worldwide that focus on endpoints and endpoint management. Um, you know, we, we are the team that brought Windows 365 to market in conjunction, again, with uh, business group and engineering. Um, but prior to Windows 365, uh, you know, my incubation team also worked on a product called the Microsoft Managed Desktop. Um, so we were working on Microsoft Managed Desktop for about three years. You know, even prior to that, uh, we were responsible for bringing Azure Active Directory and Intune and really the EMS suite to market. So this team has got a storied history. Um, obviously, uh, you know, throughout the years, the team uh, size fluctuates. Uh, but today, I'd say maybe there's about, about half of us um, around the world are in North America. There's about 10 of us in North America and then around the world, uh, presence in Europe and the presence in Asia. Awesome. So we wanted to bring you on and talk about the new product, Windows 365. But what I wanted to just kind of talk about before that is why we're having this conversation on virtualized desktops in general. For me, it has always been a tool to use for security. A lot of security teams utilize virtual desktops as a tool to help have guardrails on what certain employees, remote employees, contractors have into the environment. But typically, it's not something that security defenders have managed in the past we want it implemented but we don't own the implementation generally it's something that like the server teams or infrastructure teams have typically managed and if you're talking about traditional vdi it's extremely complicated it's usually hosted on prem it usually has you know the remote desktop connection broker servers you have maybe an is server that you have to maintain um, as as well as session hosts and gateways. So there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of servers that you have to manage, and it's a complicated deployment. And so with modernization of that traditional VDI, a few years ago, we came out with a product called Azure Virtual Desktop. Back then, it was called Windows Virtual Desktop, and it has been rebranded as Azure Virtual Desktop. And that kind of offloaded a lot of that traditional 
infrastructure to Microsoft to take care of. So with Azure Virtual Desktop, there's a lot of things that we take care of, like the connection broker and the gateway and all that. And you're still managing some of the, the hosts and infrastructure that way. And then we started modernizing a little bit more. And now we have Windows 365. So that's kind of just, in my mind, it's important for security defenders to understand VDI. It's important for us to know kind of how it evolved from traditional on-prem and you know we've talked about on the show where we need to modernize our endpoints moving from traditional domain join to azure ad join and it's kind of the same thing with this vdi infrastructure so that's just a little premise of why i think it's important for us to talk about it why i think it's important for security so kind of moving into avd and w365 or windows 365 when we came out with AVD, we offloaded some certain things like the connection broker and the gateway, but we're still having to handle the customers or the users, the teams are still having to handle some of the infrastructure. How does that differ with like what we have with Windows 365? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a good question. And in fact, um, you know, maybe, maybe just a, um, set the tone here a, a little bit. We, we launched Windows 365 on August 2nd. Um, specifically myself, um, I've probably done maybe 250 briefings on Windows 365 since August 2nd. We're, we're running at the clip or, or pace at about five a day, four, four or five a day. Um, so I just, I just want to give you a sense of like kind of how many personal conversations I've had with customers about Windows 365. The number one question I get I thought you already had an offering in market for Microsoft to provide VDI out of the cloud. And so this, this concept of like, let's level set by differentiating, you know, what is AVD versus what is Windows 365? And, and why would we introduce what, you know, on the surface could appear duplicative um, or, you know, maybe at worst a competitive service. So, so let me talk a little bit about kind of how I think about AVD. Um, and I warned you already, I have an exchange server background and I like to see history repeat itself here because essentially, if you think about what we did with Exchange, and I'll talk more in, in detail here in a minute about this, but if you think about what we did with Exchange, it was a traditional on-prem product that we then moved into software as a service. Um, it, it's a great lesson because everybody's super familiar with that. They've got a lot of personal stories and it, and it kind of um, you know can conjure up some uh, sort of, let's just say, uh, uh, emotional recollection, le recollections in people's head when they think about that journey. But... Let, let, let's just start with AVD. Like, like fundamentally at its core, AVD is a platform capability that runs on Azure. And so, you know, if you think of what Azure really is, if you boil it down, it's compute network and storage. Okay. Those are the building blocks that then AVD sits on top of and AVD innovates on top of. So you could look at AVD or uh, let, let, let's even go even more basic. You could look at Azure as a place to go host really traditional IaaS, which is like infrastructure as a service. And if you say you want to use infrastructure as a service, but load up a Windows 10 or Windows 11 desktop, you know, you'd have virtual machines running in the cloud. When you think about VDI as a platform service in Azure, we at Microsoft then have uh, developed or acquired or integrated capabilities to deliver Azure Virtual Desktop. You've got a VDI control plane. It allows you to create host pools. These could be multi-session desktops. They could be personal desktops, you know, kind of the uh, persistent in nature. We give you a set of profile management tools. We acquired a company a few years ago called FS Logix that allows you to essentially disconnect and attach profile to something like a non-persistent session. So when a user logs off, we take their profile, we kind of store it off to the side, and when they log in and we provision a new machine from an image, we can reattach their profile and it allows them to, you know, I'll say, uh, increase the provisioning speed at, at which we can deliver virtual machines. But, but these are all really fundamental components that you boil them down. They all consume network compute and storage, okay? So AVD has essentially this, uh, call it a bag of tricks or a set of capabilities but fundamentally, it's not a service offering in and of itself. AVD is a collection of VDI tools that customers can go design, build, and deploy and, and effectively support and manage their own VDI deployments on Azure. Okay, so, so think of 
AVD is nothing more than platform components. Commercially, there's a commercial model that says, hey, the more you consume, because it's Azure-based, the more you consume those, those bottom line components, that uh, network, compute, and storage, the more you consume those, you know, the more you pay. You leave a machine run, you know, the compute charges spin. You want to store and manage 25 different images, you know, you pay for the storage on those. So, so fundamentally, that's how AVD works, okay? So then you contrast and you think about, well, what is Windows 365, okay? Now, this is where I'll go back and let's unpack this Exchange Server analogy. Like, like 12 years ago, I used to go meet with customers that were on Exchange 2007, and I'd say, hey, let me introduce you to all the innovation that we put into the product. That's Exchange 2010 or Exchange 2013. Here's the new server role architecture. Here's the new storage paradigms. You know, here's, here's how you're going to architect and deploy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now, when you think about fundamentally how our customers consume Exchange, they buy a license for Office 365, they assign it to a user, you know, poof, they have a mailbox running in the cloud immediately. It's got all the latest features. Exchange Server SaaS, Exchange Online, is built on cloud principles. It's evergreen. It allows us to stream continuous innovation. Uh, we offer it in a, a subscription model that allows customers sort of elasticity in the amount of licenses that they carry. So there's a lot of benefits when you put the service wrapper around a product. So I want you to think about, let's go back to Windows 365 then. We have AVD, which is this platform you know, capability, if you will. What we've done with Windows 365 is we've built that software as a service wrapper. and We've put it around AVD. And what we have in market essentially delivers on this promise. You buy a license for Windows 365 or you, you buy a subscription to Windows 365, you assign that license to a user and poof, they have a desktop running in the cloud. Okay, You don't have to interact with the VDI components, much like in Exchange Online, you don't interact with databases and servers and you don't provision the infrastructure. You just consume the end product. With Windows 365, we run the infrastructure and we provide it to you in a software as a service model with those cloud principles. Yeah, that's a great summary. One of the things that you mentioned was the multi-session. And I want to kind of be clear, Windows 365 is a great product, but there are still also some use cases. And it's okay. I've talked to some customers where you know they may have a use case for both of them in their environment because those multi-session um, desktops that you may be able to provision with AVD or maybe you just want to deliver an app um, and yeah. it's still superior than the old school VDI or maybe even some of our competitors like uh, Amazon Workspaces or VMware because yeah. traditional VDI is is Windows server based. And so sometimes you may have some app compat issues, whereas AVD and both Windows 365 is on that desktop Windows 10 or Windows 11 image, right? Yeah, and, and, and look, I'm going to continue to bombard you all night here with the uh, with the exchange parallels. <laughs> well, well, one of the first questions that we used to ask customers when we first launched BPOS, here's a qualifying question. Do you, do you guys run BlackBerry? Because if you run BlackBerry, I can't take you to the cloud, right? You, can, you can't, you, you're not qualified, you, you know, I can't take you to exchange online. So that was like one of these things, like today, if our customers require VDI, um, and some of the VDI capabilities like non-persistent sessions or a multi-session desktop or application streaming. These are traditional VDI workloads. What we have with Windows 365 is essentially a persistent personal desktop running in the cloud. In fact, you know, when Satya announced Windows 365 on July 15th, you know, he, he christened it this new category of computing. Right. Which if you think about categories of computing, it's like mainframe, PC, client server, cloud computing. And now here with Windows 365, our vision is sort of this blend of an experience where you have the, the best of the PC, but it's also backed by and running in the cloud. And it really ushers in sort of a new era for us to drive innovation in terms of what it means to have a PC. That's much different than saying, I just want to do multi-session windows because I want a real low cost experience and I want to optimize compute. That completely different sort of value propositions and, and make no you know, bones about it. AVD is a super strategic project, uh, product for Microsoft, but so is Windows 365. Now, you know, personally, I would make the argument that the market for 
personal virtualized desktops, it, you know, that market screams SaaS, right? Because customers don't necessarily want to go and invest in all the infrastructure, the skill set, the management paradigms, the, the additional tools, et cetera, when they already know how to run physical PCs in their environment. They already know how to manage physical PCs. They know how to distribute software to physical PCs. They know how to secure physical PCs. To do that with a different set of paradigms and tools and a different team, just because they're virtual instead of physical, um, that's why I think you know this market for the for the virtual persistent desktop will move to SaaS, and it will move to SaaS. You know, probably well starting now, but you know, over the next uh, one to three to five years. Bradley, I, I want to unpack one of the points you just made there and make sure I understood it correctly. One of the things you just talked about there at the end was how organizations have this investment in managing physical PCs today, and they're really good at doing all those things you talked about, like app deployment, patching, uh, OS updates, stuff like that. And were you were you kind of suggesting that this this new paradigm with Windows three six five this this cloud PC kind of can capitalize on those existing skill sets that already are in organizations, as opposed to kind of learning different skills to manage you know, what you refer to as kind of more VDI. Yeah. And, and look, Hey guys, we're on a live stream here. I got, I got to let my dog in, but I can continue talking to you. So I just want to do the alarm, but I'm getting up here. So, um, Hey, you know, when we think, uh, let, let, let's just take the brand for a second, right? W windows, Win windows is windows, right? And windows, I like to say windows is for everyone. But the other thing is this brand has this 365 yeah. moniker. And if you think about that 365 moniker, right? You think about Office 365, you think about Microsoft 365. You know, Microsoft 365 in and of itself is a set of capabilities. It's more than just Office 365 and productivity and collaboration features, but it's infrastructure, it's security, it's management, it's compliance. And so when you think about where Windows 365 fits in the spectrum of Microsoft 365, it's sort of a part of this Microsoft 365 family, much more so than it is maybe an additional Azure service. Mm -hmm. And so um, in very intentionally, Windows 365 puts a service wrapper around AVD to deliver a desktop in the cloud but all the integration hooks into Microsoft 365. Look, the control plane for Windows 365 is actually right inside of Endpoint Manager, okay? And if, if we just sort of break down, um, and, and we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but let, let me just break this down for you. When, when I say, you know, we want you to just buy a license for Windows 365, assign it to a user, and poof, they have a desktop running in the cloud. Like, let's demystify that magic behind the poof, right? The reality is we take, we take an image, we provision windows from that image. We, we then, uh, well, we create a network connection for that, for that virtual desktop. We join it to a customer's domain. Azure AD connect synchronizes that cloud PC to Azure AD. We enroll that device into endpoint manager. And what comes out on the other end of maybe like a 20 minute provisioning process is a domain joint, hybrid domain joint, uh, endpoint manager managed, uh, trusted PC. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word trusted because we absolutely have the ability from the time that that device is considered provisioned can assert trust on that device. Okay, and 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 we can assert that trust because of investments in Microsoft 365, and in Intune, and System Center, and Active Directory, and Azure AD. And, and uh, you know, Microsoft Defender for endpoints, right? We could continue to go down the list and say, we can build an assertion of trust to where if that device is not trusted, we can actually take action on it. But, but, but let's not go too far with that uh, just yet. Um, the idea that I will never take a Windows 365 device, provision it and turn it over to IT or an end user and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't join your domain. So here's a work group PC, go ahead and just troubleshoot it. And, and get it joined to your domain manually, right? If I can't complete the provisioning of this device to make it integrated with your identity stack and managed with your uh, endpoint manager suite, then I'm gonna throw the cloud PC away and we're gonna start over with provisioning, okay? So one of the fundamental premises is here is that I've got very deep integration with the, with the tool set that you already use to manage physical PCs, 
but I'm also automating an entire layer of essentially the AVD stack. And so we're taking the platform components that AVD innovates on, we put a service wrapper around it, and then we drive all the automation that then integrates Windows 365 with all your existing tools. I've heard you say this before to a customer when I've been on a call with you, Bradley, is AVD, you do have to have some expertise in the VDI architecture. And in fact, it's kind of like we give you the tools to build something, but you can absolutely build a product in AVD that doesn't work. In fact, I've, I've done it before. <laughs> Andy, you I know, know you've done that many times. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can give you all the tools and you can build a solution for yourself that does not work. But right. with Windows 365, do you think that is the case? Like, can you take someone who is like a help desk person and, and basically provision a PC for someone? Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll say at the at like the output of Windows 365 is a Windows PC. And I'd say we probably all had experiences maybe where we're uh, re-imaging laptops or we're, you know, uh, building a, a Windows PC. You know, maybe you're trying out Windows 11 um, and, and you've messed something up and you had to start all over again. So, so, so you know, at the end of the day, you're going to end up with a Windows PC and the Windows platform, right? And so... Mm-hmm. You still have to layer tools on top of that. But I think what, what you're really talking about here is, look, and you kind of highlighted it in the beginning here, you know, back in, back in the day with, with VDI on-prem, you know, you have these layers. It, it's kind of like, you know, if you just sort of apply, I'll just say kind of the concept of an OSI model, right? You have the infrastructure, server, storage, networking, then you have the hypervisor and all the VDI control plane elements. Oh, and then by the way, at the end of the day, what you end up with is a Windows desktop that you then have to install software on, create images for, you know, patch, patch line of business apps, do threat and vulnerability management, install uh, security software, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we're doing with Windows 365 is we're removing some of the layers to be able to get faster access to that Windows desktop in the cloud. Okay. And so... It, it is very true. It, you know, we witnessed it here in the last two months where we have customers that come to us and say, I have immediate demand. Um, you know, we can we can take some time today, too, and we can talk about kind of what are these use cases that we're seeing and what's the demand that we're seeing. But I'll just highlight, you know, maybe an obvious one that we have is right now there are, there are complaints and uh, constraints in the supply chain market for physical PCs, right? Customers um, are relying on whether it's it's hybrid work, whether they're relying on more of their vendors, customers, and partners uh, to help them in the supply chain, uh, you know, uh, the gig economy, right? There's a, there's a lot of places where traditionally maybe a customer has provided someone a PC where they're now looking to maybe provide that through a virtual desktop or, you know, very specifically a Windows 365 cloud PC. What we've seen is customer response quite literally from the time in which we can, um, you know, provision licenses into their tenant, it could be less than two hours before they have 100, 150 cloud PCs deployed. Because once we set up a couple of infrastructure components, right, there are actually only three configuration screens for Windows 365 that are really required to start provisioning desktops. Now you're just talking about assigning licenses. And look, in Microsoft 365, you've got group-based licensing imagining provisioning 150 virtual desktops is as easy as just adding 150 people into a group, right? It's, it, it comes down to, you know, I'm not necessarily going to say no skill set, but the skill set that you use very, again, very purposefully and intentionally, the design is the skill set that you use to manage your physical PCs. You reuse that skill set to, to deploy virtual desktops as well. You know, Bradley, hearing you, as you've gone through the conversation, use this analogy to exchange server. I lived on the other side of that. So I was in it before I came to Microsoft. And one of the things I was part of was a Lotus notes on premises to exchange online migration. And I had fallen into that role literally because the person who occupied it before said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to learn the cloud. I don't want to learn office 365. And I don't know what her reasons were, but I know for me, there was still a, a, some skill needed in terms of understanding 
the the use cases and the needs and the configurations you wanted to deliver. But there are a lot of things that were non-value add that went away. And ultimately, I personally, at a pretty young age, was able to run a 10,000 mailbox environment with very little day-to-day care and feeding. And then that opened me up to start doing other value add things for the organization where my whole day wasn't spent managing email anymore. So I got to look into SharePoint or Office 365 video or other services and start delivering additional value. And I, and I think of that, there's always this concern on, on behalf of IT folks, maybe perhaps some of our listeners that, well, if they don't need my skills anymore, then they're just going to get rid of me or, or whatever. And I don't ever see it that way. My, my lived experience was different in that I found ways as my time opened up because I wasn't doing things like DR patching, stuff like that. I got to opportunity to learn new technologies, broaden my own skill set, and bring more value to the organization. And I think there's mm. a component to that as well. Yeah. Um, look, I, I made the statement earlier that exchange uh, guys used to be, uh, guys and girls uh, used to be the smartest people on the IT teams. Now I'm going to say it's the desktop team, right? If you think about, I, they need to know everything about identity, security, all the line of business apps, um, uh, remote access strategy. You know, it's like you go down the gamut of uh, how many things that a uh, desktop engineer, um, you know, they, they know every, uh, you know, where, where every uh, snafu and every uh, challenge is in, in a customer's IT environment. Um, I also like to think that, you know, we, we at Microsoft have demonstrated that, you know, the cloud is, I think, more, more than just getting rid of low value work. Um, you know, the, the, the way that I've really seen Microsoft apply the cloud is really as an extension of our customers uh, team as well. And so we have accountabilities at Microsoft that we bring that are fundamental to these service wrappers that I talk about. When I talk about putting a service wrapper in in Windows 365, think about this. Um, We mobilize the AppAssure team where we can make a promise to our customers to say, if an experience works on a physical PC, we want that physical experience, I'm sorry, we want that experience to be um, available on a Windows 365 desktop. And in fact, we've carved out folks within AppAssure that if our customers, you know, call up Microsoft support or you engage with your customer success account manager and you have an issue with, um, you know, an application that runs fine on a physical PC, but it doesn't run on Windows 365, you know, Microsoft will back that, right? And so as an IT professional, think of, you um, you know, the, the Microsoft accountability that we bring this, this, the, you know, the entire might of Microsoft. And I'll, I'll maybe give another example too that that's sort of relevant for exchange. We didn't just put a wrapper around an exchange mailbox and say, I can do it better than you can. We built an entire team called fast track that will help actually engage our customers to go get the value faster. And so there were, there was all these additional accountabilities that we built that maybe I could never do against an on-prem product. And so now you're relying on not only my engineering team to solve some of your problems. Uh, here's another exchange parallel. You know, back in the day, it used to be, how do I get rid of all these attachments that were in my uh, mailboxes? And there was, you know, third party tools that came in or customers would, de- you know, try to deploy larger mailboxes. And we were really just kind of pushing the problem around. And as soon as you, you know, as soon as you gave me the ability to go solve that problem for you, what did I do? We invent modern attachments. We drive integration between OneDrive and Exchange so that I can take the attachments out but improve the user experience, okay? So you want my engineering team on your hardest problems and you wanna partner with me. And that's the promise of putting a service wrapper around something like Windows 365, is that we're gonna drive all the automation to make this work. You know, IT pros still get to be the heroes that say we needed 5,000 PCs and we need them next week because we're doing an acquisition. You get to be the hero that you got it done, but you didn't, you know, you got to rely on the partnership with Microsoft to go make it happen. I think that's a really good point. And there's, there's two things I want to unpack there. Number one, you talked about AppAssure and for any of our listeners that aren't familiar with that offering, where that originally came from was when yeah. organizations were still doing that windows seven to windows 10 migration, there was a promise that 
if you have an app that works in Windows 7 and doesn't work in Windows 10, you can call us and we'll make it work. We will figure out a way, whether that's adjusting the operating system, working with the vendor, putting in a shim in the OS, whatever the case may be, we make it work. And so hearing that AppAssure paradigm has been brought forward now, since that migration's mostly done-ish, um, minus some stragglers, now that it's the kind of that same promise modernized for the cloud that if something works in a physical PC, we'll make it work in cloud PC. That's yeah. really, really cool. And then I think the other thing as, as a security seller at Microsoft, a, a point I frequently make as well, you talked about, you know, maybe the initial promise of the cl cloud is, is unchaining organizations from low value work, but then you start to realize benefits of the cloud that could only happen in the cloud. And yeah. that's something we talk about with security where, cloud originally was, is cloud secure enough? You know, is it better to stay on premises? And the conversation has completely shifted today to where the cloud is a security imperative because organizations without cloud capabilities, they don't have visibility into the threat landscape enough to protect themselves adequately versus by partnering with a Microsoft and getting access to yeah. 8 trillion security signals a day and getting that protection automatically without you having to do anything. If somebody goes and gets attacked in South Africa and you get that protection for yourself here in the United States of America, that's really powerful versus before when you were your own ship on the sea, you didn't get that. So I totally yeah. align with that point around cloud innovation above and beyond thinking past just like the cloud taking away this, this unglamorous work I don't want to do. Yeah. You know, um, I thought about this today too. Um, th this, the, you know, these are value props that software as a service is really brought to the table. If you think about sort of the history of software, right. That when, when, when you have development teams that can take traditional software and maybe implement a microservices architecture to drive innovation at a faster pace, Right, that, that's what the cloud is enabling. Um, I can think of you know, only a handful of companies that maybe started out with a legacy of on-prem software that have completed or are on a path to actually do a complete transition of those products, either to you know, a hybrid operating model, uh, like you know, we still have Exchange Server and we offer Exchange Online, but you, you know, we're right in the midst of probably one of the greatest transformations in the most popular piece of software on the planet, and that's Windows. And so, um, you know, at Microsoft, you know, we have the ability here to kind of look back at our history and say, man, Exchange Server was the most popular commercial email software on the planet. And we took, and we figured out what it took to turn that into a, a commercial cloud service, right? And all the learnings that we had there. Now, now we're doing that with Windows as well. And so we can, you know, fundamentally, I think, just start to think and dream a little bit about, you know, some of the potential of, of where this can go and how, you know, um, you know, if you just sort of use your imagination and think about the possibilities of what it means to actually run a, a computing operating system in the cloud, as opposed to maybe even just transforming a piece of software from an installable software to a cloud service. Like Microsoft now has this sort of legacy of being able to demonstrate that we can, um, you know, change the tires on the car when we're going down the road at 50, you know, 50 miles an hour. Right. And, and so um, I'm excited to see, you know, as we have a great product in market today that delivers on uh, this promise of simplicity for our customers, uh, while at the same time, uh, I'll say providing a, a really a fantastic user experience. We get nothing but rave reviews about, uh, the performance and the end user experience on Windows 365, um, you know, but but I also think about, you know, kind of, again, uh, wh where this product, you know, could be given the possibility of, you know, it's uh, r really endless one to three to five years from now. Yeah. One of the things that is really unique about Microsoft and Adam and I have talked about this before is that we're not only a, a technology company, but we're also a gaming company. Xbox brings a lot of innovation to some of our products. And for me, I think one of the incubation you know, concepts of where Windows 365 may have come from is the new Xbox platform, where instead of having physical media and having a hard drive and installing those games locally on the Xbox, 
we have a new service that where you're streaming those games from an Azure data center and you're not playing those games on your Xbox. The new Xbox that are out are literally just a conduit to stream that game onto your TV. You're actually playing it in an Azure data center. And so some of the concepts um, that we're trying to talk about here, if you're a traditional VDI person, you know, and you're trying to wrap your mind around this, it's literally as if I gave you a physical PC, but it's in the cloud. It's, it's just the PC that's running on Azure data center and it's yours to use. It's, it's persistent. You can log into it from your work, go home and, and log into it from home and it's persistent and, and all of that. So that's, I think that's pretty unique for Microsoft to have. I wanted to kind of um, go into a little bit more detail now that we're kind of down the path of, of uh, this discussion. And you mentioned the three things that you got to set up. So if I was a customer and I want to get started on Windows 365, I, I'm, I'm listening to this. I hear what you're saying. I think, man, this is, this is great stuff. How do I actually get started? Um, you know, the, the first couple of things that I need to do to set up Windows 365 before I start assigning licenses and provisioning those couple hundred PCs. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to, you need to acquire some licensing because today in Endpoint Manager, you'll have a node for Windows 365, um, but we don't actually light up any of the admin experience unless uh, you, you have licenses, okay? So assuming that the licenses are out of the way, um, inside of Endpoint Manager, there's a Windows 365 node. Um, Uh, this is where the story around Windows 365, I, I think it's really interesting when you look at the automation that we've done. Um, and there's been some, uh, I'll say, innovation uh, to deliver um, um, some of the integration components that, that we're going to talk about right now. Okay, so in the Windows 365 service, Microsoft runs the storage and compute. But... I'll say at least initially, it, it wouldn't really do any good for customers if uh, we were to just, you know, run these cloud PCs um, not integrated with your uh, uh, identity or your management environment. Okay, so the first thing that you have to do is that we actually ask you for an Azure virtual network from one of your um, Azure subscriptions. Okay, so if you think about it, I host the compute and the storage, but the customer brings the network, okay? And then Azure Virtual Network subnet, that's an internal private IP address that the customer manages. They control all the routing rules for that. They control network security. One of the requirements that we have for that network, first of all, I'll just say today as the service exists, we do hybrid uh, Azure AD join. Okay, and, and the definition of hybrid Azure AD join would be I'm joined to an Active Directory domain, but I also have a relationship with an Azure AD uh, tenant as well. Okay, the first thing that we do is we're going to provision that cloud PC and join it to the customer's domain. So just by sort of technical association, that Azure subnet that customers provide us has to have routability to the domain controllers uh, that uh, are a part of the domain that want us to join. Okay, so the first step is customer says, I want you to use this Azure subnet from this Azure subscription. Okay, and, and under the covers, part of the requirements that we have documented, we say uh, that network has to have routability to a domain controller. In fact, uh, when you're done configuring these three screens, one of the things that we do is we go validate all these conditions to be true before we actually let you start creating cloud PCs. Okay, the first thing is you provide me a network. The second screen basically says, okay, you've provided me a network with routability to a domain controller, but I don't have the rights to join your domain. So give me a service account and point me to a domain controller. Tell me what OU you want me to put these machines in. Okay, so that's two out of the three screens. What network do you want these on? And how do I join your domain? The third screen really talks about what do you want the baseline experience to be? You know, this is essentially we ask you, what image do you want to use? Customers can build their own image. In fact, if you have images that use an AVD, you can use those images in Windows 365 provided that they're not multi-session image because we're not a multi-session offering. So you have to be, you know, Windows 10 or Windows 11 Enterprise. Then you can use that in Windows 365, uh, the, the same image. 
But we also publish a set of gallery image uh, images. We keep those gallery images up to date with the latest in security patches. So you could choose. In fact, I would I would venture to guess that uh, some of the customers that I have that are starting to work on deploying Windows 365, some of the first Windows 11 desktops in their environment will probably be on cloud PC on Windows 365. We have a Windows 11 gallery image. We have several different um, feature update versions of uh, Windows 10 images, but you have to tell me what image do you want me to provision? Those are the three screens. Tell me what image, tell me what network, and tell me how to join your domain, okay? So the one piece, the one component that's missing from, I'll say, the VDI configuration is, where do I get my hardware resources from? How do I know what, you know, the specifications of the virtual machine that I'm provisioning? And in fact, what we've done is we've tied that into the specific license. So you'll, you'll, you'll buy a subscription for a two core, eight gig of RAM, 128 gig hard drive, or a four by 16 or an eight by 32. And when you assign that license to the user, we essentially match them up with these three configuration screens through an Azure AD group, right? You'll set up the network, the domain join and the image. We ask you to tie those to an Azure AD group. Maybe you name the group windows 365 dash us East, because actually, um, uh, incidentally, the Azure virtual network that you provide to me runs in an Azure data center region. That's how we know what Azure data center region to provision the virtual machine. Okay. So we just tie all these settings to a group. You take a licensed user, you add them into the group. We have all the ingredients of the recipe we need to support a VDI deployment in your environment. You want to support a VDI deployment of Windows 365 in uh, Europe North in US West, US East and Canada Central, you know, create four Azure AD groups, create four separate configurations, uh, give me four different Azure AD subnets and just start adding licensed users into the appropriate groups and we'll support a global distribution of users on Windows 365, right? Uh, I, I really wanna say, it, fundamentally it is that easy. I got, I got two things yeah. uh, for our listeners here. Number one, uh, Adam, Bradley, and I, we all, most of the time, we talk to larger customers, enterprise customers with uh, enterprise agreements, EAs. Uh, we do also have a separate license for Windows 365 that falls under the business or smaller business uh, users. There is a hard cap limit for 300 users for that one, um, but it is even simpler because there isn't this requirement to talk to the domain controller there isn't this requirement they're they're actually um user provision you you assign the license to the user and the user can go and self-provision it's azure ad joined and it's a, a modern experience so there's even less it um back-end requirement uh for the business licenses yeah uh and then the other thing is um and I forgot what I was going to say, so we'll just move on. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the business. You know, the way that I kind of think about this is it's either, you know, sort of a departmental approach, but it, it really, um, it removes some of the complexity of, you know, if you're a small business owner and you have five employees and you want to give everyone a desktop or personal desktop in the cloud, you don't want to maybe necessarily have to know anything about Intune or know anything about Active Directory you want to be able to just say, hey, here's a PC. That, that's kind of how I want you to think about business. It's good for some maybe departmental scenarios or, again, kind of this uh, small business or this very convenient access. Um, but, you know, in, in, the, in the vein of the listeners of your podcast, if we're talking about VDI and VDI management and security, you know, typically these are uh, enterprise, I would say, if you're an enterprise customer, of, of Microsoft, you know, enterprise is probably going to be 99% of the, the deployment, um, uh, you know, at larger customers. Uh, absolutely. I remember what I was going to say. So real quick here, right. I did have, you know, when, when it comes to security, I did have a customer ask me, you know, when it comes to VDI for those contractors. And oftentimes when you're trying to give access to a contractor, you do want to limit the amount of access to their internal network when you provide them to that. And so what Bradley was talking about, how you can provision uh, different VNets in different regions and have those provision cloud PCs in those same regions, your VNets can also be provisioned 
you know, when you terminate those VPN connections in your environment, you can segment those VLAN connections. So each one of these provisioning policies can have a network connection associated with it in a different zone if it's required to do that. But you can also have a network connection, a VNet that terminates and is segmented on your internal network. Therefore, the cloud PC will only traverse that network and only give access to a certain part of your network when it gets on-prem. So that does another use case that I like to point out is that you can have some granular controls on the access of what your user is going to get when it's joined to that network. So we've kind of talked through here the, the, the steps you need to get deployed. And now I'd be curious to kind of pick Bradley's brain a little bit on the use cases where we're seeing this used or what customers are thinking about using it with, or, or maybe even some, some use cases we've thought of as well, but, but what would be some scenarios where we see windows 365 used or we think it should be used um, that make a lot of sense. And, and Bradley, while you riff on that, I wanted to kind of have you touch on one more thing as well. When, when we had kind of a one-on-one discussion about this several weeks ago now, or maybe even over a month ago, yeah. another thing you mentioned that was interesting was potential almost paradigm shift in terms of PC hardware and how mm-hmm. that relates to this. And so I'd be curious to can I have you share some of those thoughts as well with our listeners, because I thought a lot of the things you were thinking about were really, really interesting. Yeah. So... <clears throat> um. I learn all about the use cases for Windows 365 from my customers. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I, I think sort of at the end of the day, after we launch Windows 365, you know, what we spit out on the other end is a domain joined endpoint manager managed Windows 10 or Windows 11 PC, just just like what our customers can do with physical PCs. Um, But obviously, again, this, this runs in the cloud. And so you think about with the combination of those elements and sort of this instant provisioning and the simplicity, you know, what are these use cases that we're seeing from customers? So first of all, um, I'll say, you know, again, supply chain constraints around the physical PC market where we have customers that, um, you know, maybe need to refresh PCs. I had one customer uh, tell me they've got 25,000 uh, desktops up for at least refresh and, um, you know, supply chain constraints they need to provide these people uh, a more up-to-date and modern experience. Um, look, I'll just add, you know, Windows 11 comes with some hardware requirements that may be that, you know, some older PCs that are uh, running in customer's environment may not be Windows 11 upgrade eligible. So the notion of maybe providing them a Windows 11 experience on that hardware could be delivered by provisioning a Windows 365 cloud PC running Windows 11. In the full screen experience with the remote desktop client, you don't even know you're on a virtual desktop. Um, and so I'm seeing customers think about the application of this technology um, in that way. I, I, I have another customer that just announced they were going to acquire a company of 5,000 people. And if you think about mergers, acquisitions, kind of divestitures, joint ventures, those types of scenarios, there's usually these sort of day one requirements. Um, you know, if you've ever been involved in this type of activity, you know that there's a lot of planning going into making sure network connectivity can be in place and making sure that, uh, you know, uh, um, that we can create uh, collaboration between the groups and intranet access and signing up for benefits. There's all this work that needs to go to day one support. Imagine if you could say, I don't need to provision a VPN. I don't need to give your PCs access to my network because I can provide you a Windows 365 cloud PC provisioned on day one. It's not untrusted hardware. It's not non-standard hardware, but instead what I'm doing is I'm provisioning a trusted experience for this acquired entity to come in and consume resources, collaborate and share. It's a really powerful statement to think. It's acquiring the licenses, it's assigning them to the users, poof, they have desktops. With Windows 365, we provide in any time, anywhere access model, okay? Our connection broker lives in Azure. It's integrated with uh, Azure AD conditional access. So we can do things like drive multi-factor authentication when you're coming in from outside the network or if you're an untrusted resource or coming in from an untrusted device. Um, So customers can go create the experience that they want to really carry trust all the way into this desktop computing environment. 
And that really helps them solve some scenarios where in the past it would be, um, look, look uh, probably the most extreme example is, you know, when the COVID quarantine hit 18 months ago, you know, I was watching physical desktops and monitors come streaming out of office buildings because not everybody had a portable computer, but yet they all had to go to work and, and from home. The notion of being able to ext extend this trust all the way into this computing platform, while maybe trust hadn't been established on the host device, that's a really that's a really powerful thing. Imagine now being able to you know rely on vendors in your supply chain where you don't have to do things like ship them a physical PC in order for them to be productive, but instead provide them a virtual experience. And because of the breadth of of reach of Azure. You know, you can provision virtual machines in, in India for call center resources. You can provision subject matter experts PCs in Australia without ever having to, you know, ship them hardware. And so there, there's these scenarios where you think of if I don't have the constraint of moving physical equipment around, or I don't have the constraint of asking someone to access my resources from an untrusted device, then what are the scenarios that can be unlocked, okay? So we, we, we've talked about a couple of them. Now you mentioned this physical device piece. Um, I'm starting to get what I'm gonna call is some customers who latch onto this vision that start to say, you know, um, we've been thinking about changing um, the commercial model that we currently buy our, our PCs, right? Maybe, maybe you know, I'd, I'd say there was kind of a, a fad you know, three to five years ago to shift uh, PCs from maybe CapEx to OpEx and move towards more of a lease model. I think with Windows 365, we can kind of think of a shift in paradigm that says, well, maybe rather than uh, deeply valuing all the compute that's on that local device, you could look for, you know, low cost computing devices or really any computing devices or support something like a BYO. Maybe you provide your employees a stipend, they purchase hardware from a curated list, and now you're providing them with subscription and user computing. And I go back, uh, maybe maybe for the final time here to kind of uh, parallel back to Exchange. <laughs> you know, we talked about the elastic capability of, of your subscriptions. You know, if you have, um, uh, let's say, interns, contractors, uh, uh, transient workers, you know, there's, there's a whole set of sort of an elastic workforce that could be addressed with subscription end user computing that might not require deep investment in physical hardware. And I'm not talking about providing them sort of least common, dom, uh, least common denominator computing experiences. I'm talking about maybe a low cost computing device, a low cost Windows PC combined with a four by 16 or an eight by 32 subscription experience for that developer or the engineer that maybe you only need to retain their services for six months or, you know, certainly less than the three year lease or the four year lease. I've got some customers that come to me and say, you know, the average, um, the average uh, uh, employee stays at my organization for five years. And it really puts some strain on desktop refresh here because I don't know, should I do a three year refresh a four year refresh? You know, I end up with a closet full of devices or I'm handing new employees devices that aren't fully paid for, but it's not a brand new device. And we think about well, what if we then start thinking about the shift to subscription and user computing with an elastic model that provides a great experience. And then we start to think differently about the physical hardware. Now, I will say um, Windows 365 is not a roadmap, you know, for the end of the physical PC, Right. Uh, the physical PC is an awesome computing experience. It's the most secure exp uh, computing experience and the most productive uh, computing experience on the planet. But think about it. I can't take a cloud PC offline. Okay. So right there, I'd say there's an immediate value in saying the physical PC is, is still, um, you know, the best way to com consume Windows. Windows 365 is the tool in your tool belt to be able to go address some of these scenarios where you have a hard time delivering either trust through that physical PC or to actually, you know, move that physical PC through your supply chain to get it into your end user's hands. Andy, I want to take an analogy you made earlier and tie it to something in, or sorry, something Bradley just spoke about, which was you did that Xbox analogy with the Xbox cloud streaming. And this is not any internal information. So I can share this publicly because we've shared it publicly on our 
Xbox blog, the Xbox team is working on like an Xbox stick, you know, like Amazon is fire stick. Like it's just a uh, HDMI thing that plugs in. We've announced that we're working on that an Xbox stick that just plugs in your HDMI port syncs with your Xbox controllers, but streams all the games from the cloud. Now for some people that might make a ton of sense. Hey, here's something super cheap. You know, let's, let's just spitball and say it's 50 bucks and I stream all my games from the cloud and they're awesome. And I just have controllers and it's great, but there's still going to be some people who say, you know what? I'm going to be in an RV. I'm going to be moving around the country or I have bad internet where I live or, or whatever the case may be. I still see a need to have that physical game system with all the compute and GPU and all that on my premises. And I think, you know, to that analogy you made that, that brings it kind of back full circle here. Same thing we're talking about. There's a lot of scenarios where we could get by with, you know, a, a thinner PC essentially, or even another device because windows three, six, five works on iOS, Android, Mac OS, not just windows. Um, and, and can make sense in a lot of scenarios, but not every scenario. And so I think that's a, a really cool kind of way to tie it all together that, uh, a lot of these technologies kind of play off each other as, as we're building them. Yeah. You know, you bring it up, we haven't mentioned it yet, but, um, you know, the way that you access so your windows 365 cloud PC, um, you can do it from any HTML5 browser, but there are also a set of rich clients across uh, most of the major operating system platforms. Windows, Mac OS, iOS, and Android all have, uh, I'll call it rich clients. Those clients, um, I, I say, you know, we're continuing to push innovation into the client um, all the time. And so as you look at the capabilities across, you know, uh, Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android in terms of the rich clients, uh, there are some differences there. So, it, it, you know, I would encourage customers to go uh, or if you're interested to go and, and, you know, kind of review the capabilities across those, I'll just maybe highlight one. You know, what what we were able to do with, with Windows, uh, the Windows client first, and I mean, there's a real fundamental reason why, you know, we might see innovation on the Windows client first, and that is we own the operating system, you know, we own the, we, uh, um, on the host, we own, we own the Windows 365 code. Um, you know, we own the remote desktop code. And so we can really pull engineering teams together uh, to really deliver innovation on Windows first. Um, but, you know, the the one capability that pops out of my mind is um, when you join a Teams meeting from within Windows 365, we have a, um, a, a capability that we've delivered in AVD that we've operationalized in Windows 365 called Teams AV Redirection. And essentially what this does is the remote desktop rich app connects directly to the team service for audio and video, rather than streaming that a, um, a multimedia content through the RDP protocol, through the connection broker, into your Windows 365 PC, to then connect into the team service, because those are really latency sensitive applications. And so we've optimized the team's experience so that you can be on a team's meeting inside of Windows 365, and yet still have a great experience from a multimedia standpoint, okay? We delivered that first in Windows. We announced a, a preview for that on the Mac OS right now. Um, no ETA on, on when it might be coming to other platforms in the browser, but I, I just wanna sort of highlight that as an illustration that there may be a reason why you're saying, hey, look, I can get to my Windows device, my Windows 365 cloud PC from any device. You know, Why would I wanna choose to buy a Windows PC or have a Windows PC to connect to a Windows PC? And I would say, the, the support for things like touch, pen, inking, peripherals, USB, you know, uh, serial ports, custom hardware, printers, you know, we could go on and on and on and say, I can deliver on Windows, on Windows 365, a really, really rich native experience. And we're probably going to always push innovation there first, learn as much as we can, and then deliver it into other platforms, um, you know, uh, as as our requirements and our customer customers ask us to do so. Yeah. One of the other use cases that I uh, came across as I've been talking to a lot of different customers is some of our uh, GCC and GCC High customers. Uh, who have those requirements and you're actually in a separate tenant. It's kind of similar to what you were talking about with M&A, but when you have different tenants and different environments and you need to reach back into maybe the commercial tenant or go into the GCC high tenant, um, I don't believe Windows 365 is in GCC high yet. 
not yet. But yep. well, you could reach back into the commercial tenant using a Windows 365 PC. Yeah, you know, the, um, we have customers that don't run their entire computing environment in those secure enclaves. And so, um, you know, I can I, I can think of, you know, if maybe 80% of your time you work in the commercial environment, but you have one customer that has GCC high requirements, or maybe you're a customer of the federal government, and you have to work in these, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, high, higher security environments, you know, you might be carrying two PCs around or you might have two different computing devices. So we have this opportunity maybe to do some device consolidation um, where you carry one device, you connect into a Windows 365 commercial environment, and maybe the host device that you have is part of the secure enclave or the secure, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, again, encourage customers to sort of look at the requirements they have. Um, you know, I would say the uh, concept of a swivel chair could be reduced or eliminated by deploying one or more Windows 365 cloud PCs to support on top of that physical device. You know, think about this. If you're a, um, let's say you're a systems integrator and you work across multiple customers and they each say, look, if you're going to come and do work in my environment, I want you to carry my laptop. And now you have, you know, four or five PCs. Imagine if those customers uh, or, or your customers supported providing you a Windows 365 cloud PC. And now you have one computing device and you can access multiple customers, you know, streamline your experience. Um, one, one, other, one other use case that I'll bring up uh, was an interesting conversation I had uh, just last week. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot of work with uh, customers in the manufacturing uh, um, industry, uh, segment. And a textile manufacturer said, do you know how much linen and fibers are floating around in the air on my plant floors? And what they tend to do is they tend to gum up and, and, and you know, um, uh, tend to accumulate inside the cooling fan on PCs. And so about once a year, we go through new hardware that we put on the plant floors. And he thought, wouldn't it be great? And, and by the way, some of these devices that they need to support are, um, you know, high performance compute uh, scenarios where it could be, you know, uh, an eight by 32 or an I seven or an I nine uh, physical device with 32 gig of Ram or 16 gig of Ram. And so we're not talking about just throw away PCs and throw away kind of, you know, browser only or kiosk style computing. We're talking about, you know, detailed drawings and, and, and detailed uh, specification. You think about dusty environments, you know, there's a need for high performance computing out where the work is being done. And the idea of maybe subscribing to that high performance compute and providing a low cost device on the plant floor. Uh, I'm not going to call it disposable, but at least, um, you know, when the device breaks or when it needs to be serviced, it could be done in a much more cost effective manner. It's immediate use case for Windows 365 without saying, well, now we have to go invest in VDI infrastructure because you could deliver that experience in VDI. But again, Windows 365, um, you know, I would say for customers that might have, you know, 10,000 endpoints or more, if I were to add 100 devices into your management stack, would you even know on a daily basis? I mean, you know, a lot of cases, maybe the amount of devices that you can reach or you can manage fluctuate by, you know, what could be the addition of several hundred cloud PCs. You know, my guess is to support a deployment of Windows 365 and those customers would be no additional burden. Yeah. Adam, anything else to add? Well, just one last thought on, on that scenario with the fibers in the air, or the dust in the air or whatever, you know, not just potentially a low cost PC, but a fanless PC too. maybe like an arm based yeah. PC um, that that is more sealed could work as well. But but again, accomplish the same results yeah, as you're talking about. So that's I, I really love the discussion on use cases because customers come to us with some very creative asks sometime. And I love thinking of, of innovative ways to solve problems with new tools as they come to market. So that's, that's really kind of fun and, and really enjoyable to, to talk about. But I, I thought this has been a great conversation. And Bradley, appreciate you yeah, coming hey, on so much with us. I, wanna, I, just wanna, I just wanna touch on one point that you made that I think is so important, right? I, I mentioned um, we're, we're bringing Windows 365 to market, but I'm not bringing the use cases with me right? Mm -hmm. It's the customers that are developing the use cases. And so you had talked about 
um, you know, the the um, invention of the cloud or the the deployment of cloud-based services is removing low low hanging work. And I talk about, you know, these IT guys and gals, they're the smartest people, right? These desktop uh, folks, they're the smartest people in IT. This this example of the fanless PCs, this is the high value work of being able to go solve that problem. I, I don't bring that context. The customers own that context. This is the way that I think our customers could um, add value to their organization by applying the capabilities that we have in Windows 365 to go solve the problems that they have. That's the high value work that they're going to be doing. Yeah. Perfectly said. We thank you so much, Bradley, for taking time out of your schedule. I know, like you said in the beginning, you've had so many conversations on this, and this is just yet another one. But uh, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to talk to us and our listeners about Windows 365. I'm hoping that they're going to have a lot to take away from this. For uh, follow-up questions, if there, you know, if there's someone who might have a follow-up question directly for you, is there some way that uh, you would like uh, questions to be directed? Uh, maybe like LinkedIn or Twitter. Or, um, yeah, you know, I would say LinkedIn would be great. I mean, I'm happy to provide my my email address is just bdupay at microsoft.com. Um, I'd say, you know, uh, post them in the, um, you know, the tool that you used to, uh, to, to watch this podcast or to listen to this podcast. And maybe uh, Andy and Adam, you can have me back for round two or maybe, maybe we do some Q&A. Love that'd it. be awesome. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd yeah. be awesome. I had a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in on the live stream if you did. Otherwise, feel free to watch the recording. They'll be up on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and our new Twitch channel as well. Um, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any follow-up questions, you want to get a hold of Bradley uh, or one of us. If you have security topics or anything that you want us to talk about, feel free to recommend them to us, and we'll talk about them in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.